Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman, board certified veterinary dentist, and we bring this podcast to you every Wednesday as a veterinarian, as a technician, as a dentistry team to help you be even better at veterinary dentistry in your practice. We're sponsored and partnered today with the Veterinary Dental Practitioner Program. If you're interested in being among the best anywhere in general practice as a team in veterinary dentistry, I invite you to request an invitation. Just go to ivdi.org slash inv, like invitation, first three letters, inv. So ivdi. International Veterinary Dentistry Institute, ivdi.org slash INV, and we'll get you the information that you need. Uh, do we know what is the cause of feline juvenile onset periodontitis? So we're transitioning to that entity, and w- the, the cause is similar to the cause of periodontal disease in that we have an attack of the uh, immune system from antigens from the bacterial plaque causing reaction in the tissue and then subsequently once that tissue barrier is broken once the junctional epithelium is compromised and the bone is exposed then that inflammation progresses to bone destruction and eventually tooth loss same thing happens in these kitties with juvenile onset periodontitis, although that, that whole process is much more severe than it is in a normal uh, cat. And so the progression, the early onset, both are, are much more severe and definitely have, have to be addressed in order to be able to get up, keep on top of these. Uh, they many times require extractions at eight months of age uh, <clears throat> or sometime around that. Incisors are particularly, in many cases, effective. They don't have to be, but <clears throat> that is the pathogenesis of that, that problem. Same as, as uh, periodontitis in cats and dogs, with plaque being the initiator, it's only the immune system is more reactive to that antigen stimulus and causes destruction much more quickly. Uh, Michelle, is there a breed predilection for juvenile onset perio? We, we seem to possibly see this in exotic breeds a little more. <clears throat> that may be partially due to the occlusions that these guys <laughs> suffer from, but uh, crowding is another factor that might predispose that and that those Exotic breeds tend to have a lot of crowding, so those are uh, the, the predilections that I'm aware of. I don't know of any studies that have been done or retrospective studies that have been done. Uh, I may be just out of the loop from that standpoint, but I'm not aware of that. Tama Kramer, what medications, if any, would you recommend prior to extractions with severe gingivitis resulting in friable tissue? Um, the the medications that would enable a little bit better handle on that would be the anti-inflammatories, prednisolone. We don't recommend that. We recommend just going in and doing the extractions, excising that tissue as much as possible, and then closing with normal tissue on either side. And again, that's being comfortable with flaps, being comfortable with handling that tissue in cats. So we, we don't, we're not going to make a big dent in friability and tissue management, if we do anything, antibiotics, steroids, that's not going to change much at all, if anything. So it's not worth the risk. It's not also not worth uh, doing doing from the standpoint of making any significant impact. So, Kareen Searle, can you point out the tooth root that you said uh, was at the base of the canine, but I see a further root caudal on the skyline rad. Excellent, Corrine. I was waiting for someone to point that out, and you were, you're the winner. <laughs> so great job, Corrine. 
in in uh, seeing that. So on this, it's 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 pretty evident that we've got this caudal root tip that's there in the back left twenty percent of that image that is superimposed over the zygomatic arch somewhat, but you can see the roots, you can see the lucency around that root. You can also see the root tip adjacent to the canine tooth in this in this patient. And then we had another question, uh, or I'm sorry, that is, uh, that's the end of that question. I thought we had another question that was involving that, but that's a great, a great observation uh, that the less obvious tooth root that's back there uh, in that post-op. And that brings up a good point, too. And I'm, uh, I'm glad that you were, you were the one to see that, Kareem. And I wanted to put that in there so it, it precludes a topic that we need to really pay attention to, and that is looking at x-rays post-operatively, even if we think we get the entire tooth root. And there are multiple times uh, over, over my career where I have thought that I've gotten the tooth root, taken a quick x-ray, and looked at the post-op and found that, indeed, uh, we left a, left a root tip and have to go back and, and get that out. Uh, fortunately, prior to closure, <laughs> because we always check that, and so it's super important in general practice to do the same thing. And we don't ever want to start to close and then take x-rays after closure just just to be sure uh, and find that this is the case because if it happens in specialty practice probably going to happen in general practice too and so we need to keep keep a, a, a sharp eye out for those x-rays and it also begs the point of maybe having another view if there's any question at all um, and cats are a good example where in the one view, and I, I should have put that up up here, but the first view that we showed, you couldn't see that tooth root. It was it was superimposed over the, the zygomatic arch, and so it wasn't visible. So it took uh, you could see it in the other two views, but it took a couple of views to be able to bring that out and, and be able to see that, so that we could go in and and extract that. And with this case, it's been a while. I can't remember. If that was a tooth root that was left prior, uh, and it may have been that both of those were left with prior extractions, I don't, I don't recall. But in taking those X-rays and being able to see that makes it so that um, you can get those out and, and avoid problems. Now, if if neither one of those had lucencies like they did, that were around the apex and they, the, the gingiva is quiet and they were left from previous extractions. Uh, there's no changes that suggest that, that there's problems in the bone around the tooth root, then we can leave those and monitor them. We don't necessarily have to extract them unless it's a stomatitis case. If it's stomatitis, every tooth root has to come out. However, we're not talking about stomatitis here, we're talking about uh, juvenile onset periodontitis. Uh, in the first case, first pick, and I'll show that uh, to you here in a second, why did you extract 409? It's a good question. Uh, there appeared to be good bone surrounding the roots with just a little bone at the frication. That's the, a great observation, Teresa. And we've got that right mandle. We've got the two, uh, the, the, the uh, 08 and the 07 premolars on that right side that have through and through frications that are definitely going to be extractions. We also have some tooth resorption on 07. And then we go to 09 and we've got a little bit of bone decrease in height on the distal aspect of the distal root. We've also got an increased periodontal ligament space right there at the margin on the distal aspect of the distal root. And then in the frication, we've got a decrease in density that's up at the crown frication interface between those two roots where it, the, the radiographic appearance is black, so there's no bone there. And then we have that, that graying versus the white. So we have that density change that suggests there is bone loss there 
Um, and for those of you who are watching that are not listening to this on a podcast, the tip of that arrow is close to where that bone level is, uh, a little bit toward the marginal bone from the tip of that arrow so that you can actually see the darkened changes in the normal white or whitish bone. <clears throat> that is where that bone has been destroyed. So with, with that, we have to remember this is a juvenile onset period on uh, Titus case. This is a young cat. This cat was 18 months of age. That only will progress. So any changes that we know are going to progress that we can't change, we talked about that, uh, and I'll remind everyone of that, in decision making on extractions for periodontal disease in general, if we can't change the course of that where we can reasonably get this pet back and do subgingival curatage. Uh, in this case, it would require opening that tissue up and uh, cure, uh, curating out that furcation granulation tissue that's going to accumulate in three months. Uh, doing it every three to six months, then we're going to extract that tooth. And uh, most owners do, are not going to do that, especially knowing that eventually that tooth is going to be gone because we're not going to be able to keep up with it. So extracting that now is going to eliminate any changes going forward and certainly is the, the way to go uh, on these cases. So great question. And then Dave, um, <clears throat> a similar, similar question, could 409, but you can see where those changes are and take what we've just discussed and understand that that tooth needs to come out because it's just going to get worse. You come back in six months, and that change in the bone is going to be more dramatic in the vacation. You're going to have less bone coverage over the distal root, and consequently, extract it now. Uh, it, it's going to happen anyway. And you're in there, you've got the whole quadrant there, looking at you, the caudal cheek teeth in that whole quadrant. Might as well get them all out with one flap and, and be done with it. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like more information, about the Veterinary Dental Practitioners Program, please submit to request an invitation at ivdi.org slash inv.